Welcome back to Catalyst University. My name is Kevin Tokoff. Please make sure to like this video and subscribe to my channel for future videos and notifications. And a big thank you to my patrons on Patreon for your contributions to my channel. In this video, we're going to be talking about the second cranial nerve, or the optic nerve, and we're really going to be looking at the pathway of this nerve towards the brain. Over here on the left is a diagram that shows the major pieces of the optic pathway. For the sake of simplicity, we're going to consider this eyeball over here the left eye, and over here this will be the right eye, and that makes this side anterior at the top, of course, and then back here where the primary visual cortex is, that's actually in the occipital lobe, so that'll be posterior, okay? Now, these numbers here, one, two, three, and four that I've color-coded, these represent areas of the visual field. So the visual field is just the field in which we can see. So when we think of one and four, these are closer to the corners of your vision on the outside, and then two and three are closest to the nose. These are in the center of your vision, okay? When we talk about the visual fields, though, we can name them according to whether they're closer to the nose or closer to the temporal lobe, so basically the outside. So for the left eye right here, visual field one, this would actually be its temporal visual field, okay? because this visual field is closest to the temporal lobe or the temporal bone. For the same eye, visual field two would be the nasal visual field, because that visual field is closest to the nose. Okay? It's a mirror image on the right eye. Three right here would be the nasal visual field and four over here would be the right eye's temporal visual field. Now, we cover this in more detail in videos on the eye, but remember that when we think about the image or light being projected onto the retina, which is of course in the back of the eyeball, remember that all the visual fields flip because the light is refracted onto the retina. So when we think about the area of this left retina here that's going to receive the light from the temporal visual field, it's actually going to be the retina closest to the nose. Okay? So for number one here, the temporal visual field will correspond to the nasal retina. Likewise, for two here, the nasal visual field will correspond to the temporal retina. And again, the retinas are named also based on what they're closest to. So this purple one right here, this would actually be the temporal retina. In red, this would be the nasal retina. And we can make the same argument on the right side. So right here, number three, this would be the right eye's nasal visual field, which is refracted onto the right eye's temporal retina. And then over here, number four, this would be the temporal visual field of the right eye is refracted onto the nasal retina, okay? Now, as we go posterior from the retina, I want you to consider the colors that I have there because that's gonna help you make sense of where specific visual input is going in the brain, specifically up to the thalamus. All right, so as we go posterior from the retina, remember that's the optic nerve. The optic nerve is ultimately formed from the axons of those ganglion cells in the retina, and it projects posteriorly. So basically, the optic nerve exists in this diagram basically from the end of the retina right here all the way to where we get this crossing over at what's called the optic chiasm, okay? So all this right here, this is the optic nerve or cranial nerve two. It's also worth mentioning that the optic nerve is going to enter the cranium through the optic canal here. There are a bunch of structures that we'll see later on in the next few videos that actually move in and out of the orbit from the superior orbital fissure, but that is not the optic nerve. The optic nerve goes posteriorly through this optic canal, and that's where it enters the cranium. Now, as the optic nerve projects back into the cranium and posteriorly, it's going to get to this point called the optic chiasm where the nerve fibers cross over. But here's the important thing. Not all of those nerve fibers cross over, okay? Let's look at the ones that cross over. We see the red ones and the blue ones. Which visual fields do those correspond to? Well, they correspond in either case, left or right eye, to the temporal visual fields, okay? Those in turn correspond to the nasal retinas in both eyes nasal retinas. And so only the nerve fibers coming from the nasal retinas actually cross over at the optic chiasm. However, if we look at uh, two and three right here, these would be the nasal visual fields corresponding to the temporal retinas. 
those do not cross over, okay? So that's an important thing. It could be an easy true or false question. Not all the nerve fibers cross at the optic chiasm. But after the optic chiasm, we now have optic tracts that project to the thalamus, okay? Now look at each optic tract. Let's look at the right one first. This is composed of the green fibers and the red fibers. What do those correspond to? Well, if we look at these, it's one and three. So actually, regardless of which eye, it's actually the left visual field. So once we get past the chiasm, now it's more helpful to think about, instead of temporal or nasal, it's now helpful to think of left versus right. So it's the left visual field in both eyes, but that's also going to correspond to the right half of the retina in either eye. Okay. If we look at the left optic tract over here, it's purple and blue. So that would be the right visual field in both eyes, and that corresponds to the left retina in either eye. Okay. And then those optic tracts are now going to project back to the thalamus. Now here, I have two thalamus that are shown. Technically, there is only one thalamus. Okay? Now, there are two hemispheres of that thalamus. So there's a left hemisphere, that's going to be this one over here, and a right hemisphere, but technically they are together, not separate like this, okay? just to make that perfectly clear. And specifically, these optic tracts are projected into a specific cluster of cell bodies in the thalamus, and that's the lateral geniculate nucleus. So over here, we're considering this to be the left lateral geniculate nucleus, over here, this would be the right lateral geniculate nucleus, or the LGN. Now, before we go any further, I want to mention one thing about these optic tracts. Not all of those fibers are actually going to go to the lateral geniculate nucleus of the thalamus. Some of them are going to make a pit stop and go off to a structure in the midbrain, which is part of the corpora quadrigemina, and that's the superior colliculi. Okay? The superior colliculi are involved in visual reflexes. So, for example, when you see something out of the corner of your eye that might potentially be a threat, it causes you kind of subconsciously to move your head in that direction, basically to orient yourself toward that visual stimulus, because it might actually be a threat. Well, the way that the superior colliculi does that is it has these connections with specific skeletal muscle, mostly in the neck, that control head movements uh, through the tectospinal tract. And so this pathway here that gets specific skeletal muscles to contract to orient your head towards a potentially threatening stimulus, this is an example of an extra genicular pathway because it bypasses the geniculate nucleus here. Okay? Um, and therefore, it's also a non-conscious pathway. Here, we're going to focus only on the lateral geniculate nuclei, which is obviously for the conscious pathway. And from each hemisphere of the thalamus, so the left lateral geniculate nuclei and right lateral geniculate nuclei, we have optic radiations uh, that project towards the primary visual cortex shown here in pink. Now there are several optic radiations on either side. We have left and right parietal optic radiations and left and right temporal optic radiations. Before we got to the thalamus, we thought of things either as temporal or nasal then we thought of things as left and right. Now we're going to think of things in terms of superior and inferior. So if we look at the parietal optic radiations, those are going to be relaying information mainly from the superior half of the retina. So not left or right, not temporal or nasal, it's the superior hemisphere of the retina, which corresponds, of course, to the inferior visual field. So not only does the crossing over the visual fields on the retina, not only does that apply in the left-right direction, but also the up-down direction. And then the temporal optic radiations are the opposite. Those are going to receive information mainly from the inferior half of the retina, which of course corresponds to the superior visual field. And this temporal and parietal nomenclature really just refers to the fact that as the optic radiations move towards the primary visual cortex, they kind of dip into those corresponding lobes, temporal lobe and parietal lobe. And that of course carries us to the primary visual cortex. Now the primary visual cortex is a region of the very back of the brain in the occipital lobe and on its most basic level it's really just responsible for the perception of vision. Now what does that mean? Perception of vision does not mean identification of objects, uh, identification of people or animals, right? That's putting a name with a face or a name with a structure, okay? Those are more secondary visual areas. 
The primary visual area is just perception of vision. So the best way to understand that is if you have a lesion to the primary visual cortex. If you have a lesion to this, you go blind. Okay? You either perceive vision or you don't perceive vision. Okay? In order to identify objects, the information here in the primary visual cortex has to be relayed to other structures, like the secondary visual cortex. Now, the secondary visual cortex is extremely complicated, as are all the other associated regions, and they're not completely understood. However, the basic idea here is that the secondary visual cortex puts an identification, whether it's a texture, a characteristic, a name, with something that you're seeing. If you had a lesion of the secondary visual cortex, you'd still be able to see, but you'd be able to identify nothing. Now, one of the leading hypotheses here is the existence of a dorsal stream and a ventral stream. So down here on this brain, we have here the occipital lobe. This is actually the primary visual cortex here in gray. And that's responsible for simply the perception of sight. Now, the information here is going to have to be sent to other regions for identification or characterization, things like that. And so we have up here a dorsal stream, which carries information uh, more into the parietal lobes there. This is the dorsal stream in green. And then in purple down here, carrying this information more into the temporal lobes and actually more inferior from uh, the primary visual cortex, this would be the ventral stream. The main difference between the dorsal stream and the ventral stream is the dorsal stream answers questions like where, okay, so more spatial awareness. And then the ventral stream is the what stream, so more identification of what the object is. Because when we identify an object, it's not just what it is, it's also its location. Here's a comparison of the ventral system, our what system, and the dorsal system, our where system. So if we think about their functions, the ventral system, or ventral stream, is for recognition and identification. Whereas the dorsal stream is more for visually guided behavior, because in order to perform a certain behavior that's visually guided, you have to know where things are, right? The basic idea would be not to bump into stuff, right? The ventral system is more detail-oriented, whereas the dorsal system is more motion-oriented. The ventral system is slower, but we're typically very conscious of it. I mean, think about it. If you're going to identify an object, you've got to be pretty conscious of what the object is, right? But in terms of the dorsal system, this one's much faster, uh, but we typically don't have as much consciousness of the things going on with this. Also, for the ventral system, its frame of reference is object-centered, Whereas for the dorsal system, the frame of reference is egocentric or viewer center, you viewing the object. And there is some evidence that we have a ventral stream and a dorsal stream. But the basic idea here is the primary visual cortex is perception of vision, and the secondary visual cortex and associated areas are more about identification of different characteristics of the object, whether it's temporal, spatial, characteristics like what is it, identification, and so on and so forth. So, Hopefully this video gave you a good understanding of the visual pathway to the brain. If you want more details on exactly how structures in the eyeball work, I'll try to remember to link a video in the description of this one. Thank you. Thanks for tuning in. Please like, subscribe, and check out my Instagram for cool science and not science stuff.